Hey everyone, Das here, and welcome to the very first episode of Hypnotic Operators. If you're listening to this via the podcast, uh, I want you to know right away that there is a YouTube channel. Just uh, look up Das Burke, D-A-S, Burke, B-U-R-K-E. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hey, there is also a podcast if you'd like to just uh, hook it up for just the audio stuff. Uh, I'm going to be talking to Marcus Rodriguez. Uh, We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, uh, He was uh, gracious enough to jump in on this first episode. We shot in Zoom in my Batcave slash, you know, uh, I was going to say basement, but it's a garage. (laughs) Uh, We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. I only gave him some of the frames. So what you'll maybe notice is that we're talking about uh, things from an acting and performance and writing creative perspective. Um, and I am pursuing the hypnotic line of inquiry basically through asking him about how he feels about creating moments and about authenticity and performance and authenticity in uh, creative work and story, etc. So um, it's, a, it's almost an undercurrent, to be honest with you, while you're listening. So uh, if you are into hypnosis or you understand the structure of it, you, you'll see a lot of it there. Um, and, uh, and if you're not, well, then, uh, you know, just to jump in on the ride. It's going to be interesting. We talk a lot about, um, well, we talk some uh, about uh, Batman and 1989, Tim Burton's specifically, music. Um, we'll talk a bit about Zack Snyder's Justice League, which has yet to come out, but is uh, announced as coming. Uh, we talk a bit about the power of creative vacuums or creative bubbles and uh, what it means to be able to create something uh, in isolation and free from the criticism or impinging influence of others and what what is gained or lost in that process. Um, So, without further ado, welcome to the very first episode of Hypnotic Operators. All right. I just pounded (laughs) myself I drank way too much water. This is going to be disastrous. All right. (laughs) Marcus, welcome. And thank you for coming to the very first episode of Hypnotic Operators, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing better than I deserve and honored and blessed (laughs) to have been invited. So thank you for having me. You're very, very welcome. Um, I'm probably going to end up putting some sort of header on the top of this, kind of explaining what the show is slash what we're doing. Okay. But, uh, so for this, I just want to jump straight into the convo. If that's cool with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Marquis, why don't you give us a little bit of your background as far as your involvement in the performing arts? Like how long? Um, gosh, did my first play in seventh grade, but to speak to my interest is actually kind of a cool for full circle story, interest to involvement. Um, I was about five years old uh, watching one of my favorite movies with my aunt, um, a movie called La Bamba, written and directed by Luis Valdez. And... Uh, you know, it, it, I, it, Batman 89, <laughs> Little Mermaid, and La Bamba were in full rotation. <laughs> All right. That's um, a good mix. It's a good mix. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know what it was about La Bamba that actually made me question um, the authenticity or the, the, the what was going on because hmm. um, it's based on the, the, the actual life story of Richie Valens and he okay. took a fateful flight to do a gig and, um, and the plane crashed. And one time I asked my aunt, how did, how did Holmes Slice <laughs> die in the, in the plane and then, and then come back to make the movie about his life? And that's when she explained to me, well, mijo, nice. he is an actor. And she explained to me the function of an actor. And I just, I know for a fact that at that point I was hooked and there was the, the my, my fate was fixed. Mm. And, um, first play in seventh grade and then um, involvement in high school. My first professional play I ever did though at the San Diego Repertory Theater was a musical called Corridos Remix. Um, Nice. 
uh, created by Luis Valdez, right? Oh. Of, of, uh, of La Bamba. <laughs> so full circle moment. But I would say now my That's career cool. is about 15 years, 15 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I would say, um, because we went to the same high school, I would yeah. say that that those were entirely formative years. We were, um, hmm. would you agree that we were like a repertory theater company? <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. 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 You know, constantly. Just dedicated. Group. Yeah. 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 They, uh, they, they gave us, um, a lot of opportunities For sure. to, okay. yeah. To uh, to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what what uh when you when you wrapped up Little Mermaid and Batman in the same piece of your origin story, basically, what do you think was speaking to you about Batman? Um. Hmm. Well, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a fantastic question. Um, I. I was so enthralled by that whole world that my my one of my grandmothers actually made me. Um, she stitched together a cowl and cape and the the emblem um, for me nice. to wear casually around the house, and I would do my little flips and as I was watching the movie. Um, I think Miss Curry is a gymnast. Yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> I think Batman was my gateway drug to the joker though i think mm. the joker was probably and as an adult i realized that his theatrics um showmanship all that i i, I think that's what i was really gravitating towards in what what in like what aspect like which piece of the theatrics like in the super villainy or in the fact that he doesn't give a shit about what the world is thinking of him well Initially, as a kid, I think it probably fed into my desire to show and to express. I don't know that I was all that um, tuned into his his uh, moral code or or <laughs> personal politics or lack <laughs> or lack thereof. Um, I For think sure, I sure. just I just thought he was fun, um, and. Um, and same, you know, same with, with Batman. He was just, you know, a lot more serious and, and, and cool looking. And as a, mm. a fledgling gay, I probably <laughs> loved that suit. Batmans <laughs> or Jokers. No, not Jokers. No, all right, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if I, if I had had the, um, the appropriate dolls, I would have probably, they would have battled and then I would have been like, now kiss. <laughs> <laughs> gotta happen somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. gotta happen somewhere. <laughs> you think the Little Mermaid was was also uh, formatively involved there? Or no. Yeah. Well, I remember taking baths, and I <laughs> I had my Little Mermaid dolls, and I had Batman. Fair. All right. Yeah. All right. I, yeah. They they were they were both uh, they were both there. The stage was was set and. There was really no line either. It didn't exist or it was blurry. I think I just, I, I loved, you know, playing with it all. Um, and extremes of, of emotions and it was all just so very colorful. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Do you feel yeah. like, so, so looking back and having questions about La Bamba, would do you feel like it was sort of a two-stage process like the involvement and interest in sort of colorful characters and mythological e stories and then realizing that this one that says it's based on a real guy but he can't be alive in order to make the movie and then an adult telling you like well yeah because that's that's an actor that's not the real guy was it definitely a two-step process or do you see those as two pieces of your life that just happen to happen at the same time Oh, that's actually a fantastic question. Uh, I think maybe the, 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 the reality that um, realizing that we, that we are able to be storytellers or a part of 
of these sort of motifs. I come from a long line of storytellers. It, it, I didn't realize until my, my 20s that I had a lot of actors in my family um, oh, and, and cool. visual artists. Yeah, I just, I didn't know. I mean, not necessarily, you know, famous ones, but, yeah, yeah, but. but um, a lineage of, uh, of performers and storytellers. So having been in this space for so long, what do you think is the core of why stories capture people? Like, why do human uh, beings care so much about that? Somebody else telling them stuff. Specifically a story, though, not just like, yo, that, that rock's gray. <laughs> well, I think part of it is escapism. Um, okay. Which, yeah, can be... Uh, Healthy. I mean, I, I, I remember being a very happy, well-rounded child and I would still escape into the world of Batman or this, this mermaid and, um, and. Well, okay. Hold on a second. Let's, let's entertain something. Would yeah. you say, cause Batman's a fairly tragic figure. He's been mm -hmm. fairly traumatized, right? That's like the whole thing he's built around. Would you say. You're like, my life's going great comparatively. Thus, I want mm -hmm. to play in the realm of the thing I don't have, which is like having to deal with the difficulty that grave and, and ugh. Or was it something along the lines of like, I feel like some stuff in my life has been tough or is tough, and I like seeing some sort of super heroic version of like a commiseration there. Or something it's, else entirely. <laughs> well, if such a process was happening, I was unaware of it. Well, yeah, um, probably. I right? was actually Continue. going to suggest more that the, the, the package of these traumas actually maybe hmm. um, fetishizes a little bit because <laughs> um, Danny Elfman, who scored Batman, yes. made, made those somber moments very accessible. And I, I mean, I can hmm. just, you know, like whenever those scenes where Bruce Wayne is uh, mourning his parents. I didn't, I didn't really intellectualize it. I, I remember more living in the score of like, da, 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 as he was like, you know, dropping roses off where they were shot. Yeah. I, I think I could have cared less about that event. I was just sort of, it was a mm. mood. What a mood. It was a mood. It was a vibe. It was a mood. <laughs> it was a mood. And, um, and, you know, Interesting. I, I'm a Leo, um, a little <laughs> astrology talk. I'm a Leo and I'm a fire trine. Um, mm. my, my sun and rising is in Leo and my moon is Aries, all three okay. fire. So I'm an emotional creature. And <laughs> honestly, um, these, 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 uh, these films mm. are very musical. Um, you know, Batman, oh my gosh, what a, what a, what a, what a piece of uh, film and music history. Um, they were, um, Warner Brothers was producing Prince at the time, so I don't know who forced who into what, but <laughs> Prince did the entire soundtrack. Danny Elfman did his magic, so Batman, yeah. in its own way, very much a musical. That, and, that's fair, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, in fact, mm. recently, like the last couple of weeks, I've seen some friends in their Instagram stories, mm. um, completely unconnected people posting um, tracks from the Batman soundtrack. What? Weird. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Isn't it? It was like, it was, it was like zapped into the zeitgeist somehow. Is this an and, anniversary um, I'm unaware of? August <laughs> 2020? Perhaps. Maybe an anniversary passed and maybe so. that's what catalyzed it. Um, but that's sort of, and I was in, in, in my own way revisiting, I think I woke up, I might've dreamt about the, the song Trust and I woke <laughs> needing to like binge it on, on like, loop for hours. <laughs> and then I saw that and I was like, something's in the air. Hmm. So Batman 89 is a musical in its own way. Um, mermaid, um, Little Mermaid musical. And sure, Le Bon yeah. are very much about music. Huh. So, um, I don't know. Uh, you asked a very probing question. I'm discovering <laughs> things along the way. <laughs> well, good, good. <laughs> no.
like the the trifecta of mm. of those films. I've literally never made this connection, but um, I I now um, am extremely um, uh, uh, words that I want to use. Um, Go for it. Uh, uh, obsessed with, addicted mm. to music. Um, I, uh, reliant is the word I wanted. I'm very oh. reliant on music in my everyday life and in my work. And so I feel like you might have stumbled upon a reason that these films were so um, important uh, to me is that they hit it out of the ballpark. The music was fire. <laughs> Do you, okay. So it almost sounds like a, uh, if you're super, if you're kind of built at the core for this music vortex at the center of everything, then you can have something. I mean, like everybody loved Batman 89 when it came out, right? So, so it's not unusual that you would like that movie. No, but like, not <laughs> Or that any other like, you know, seven or eight year old or whatever would love it. But, but specifically the music love met with something that's deeply tragic in a narrative sense, but also uh, gothically romantic in its depiction of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's using that music channel to like embed itself in you. Yeah. Uh, forever. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> absolutely. Abs absolutely. Um, mm. Then there are moments I, ha I have a somber moment and I feel like Bruce Wayne in the Batcave, but Danny Elfman's score is is definitely what is pumping through my <laughs> through my brain so you saw justice league right yes the joss whedon abomination version at least <laughs> <laughs> for now yes um, what are they uh what do they call i just started seeing that they call they call it justice league <laughs> Oh, is it Kevin Smith back in the day, or like a year or two ago, was just like, I can't believe none of us thought of this. But he was talking to the crew who who worked in the UK on both Snyder's shoot and Joss's shoot, and they called it Justice League and Justice League. And so Kevin started saying, "How did none of us do this?" Yes, <laughs> like a year. <laughs> what the? I don't know. I where it started proliferating. Was it like Reddit or just different forums? Oh, I, I barely just saw it. Oh. Um, in like oh, article headlines. And oh. I, I had a similar, I had a similar moment. I was like, this right? makes <laughs> justice. <laughs> it's probably, it probably took off once like Snyder's Justice League is actually going to get finished. It's actually happening. So probably. I, you know, I, I, have rarely begged the cosmos for <laughs> to survive. I, like I, I just, I, I have since 2007, yes. the world is always being threatened to end, whether it's, sure. you know, like Mayan calendar or a whatever. Sure. And so I keep begging Too the cosmos, nukes. let me live long enough to see the Dark Knight. Let me live long enough to see The Dark Knight Rises. Batman versus Superman, please let me live that long. And so now, <laughs> fast forward, I just really need to see the Zack Snyder cut. Hell yes. I, can't, I cannot believe this is happening. It's so awesome. It's and so awesome. Uh, the last I heard that it, 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 it is turning out so long that it's going to be episodic. Probably. I, I support that. Give me all the footage. Sure, 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 sure. I don't, so what it sounds like, and I don't think the fandom thing hasn't happened yet, right? That's later this month? Correct. DC fandom? So yes. I, he's supposed to say more stuff there. But from what I understand, he's going to... So they wrote Batman vs. Superman. Mm -hmm. and, and they also wrote Justice League during production slash before, during, after production of Batman vs. Superman. So that movie comes out in a weirdly chopped up, we cut out half an hour of this movie version. When, and at that point, Justice League is already written. And they're like a week or weeks away from leaving to the UK to go start shooting Justice League. Mm -hmm. Which is like, at that point, I think still nebulously, like probably a part one of an intended, at least part two. Yeah. Batman vs Superman comes out. 
uh, there's a bunch of divisive uh, reaction to it. I would, I would argue partly because you chopped out half an hour of a movie that didn't intend to have half an hour of the movie missing. Um, and so the studio says, oh my God, uh, part of this movie is that it's pretty dark. We know that you wanted to do a bunch of dark shit in Justice League. And we said, okay, before, but like now people seem to be upset. And one of the reasons I keep saying is like, oh, mama, Superman's too sad. And like they're fighting and Batman's killing people. I don't like it. So I think you're going to need to go. I know we like said that it was okay for like dark side to murder Lois in the bat cave or whatever you're going to do, but like, no, you can't do that. So we scale it back. So then they had to rewrite justice league like weeks out from shooting. And so that was the script they started with. That's the script that they fought to slash kept shooting the whole time until he left till Zach had to leave. And I think what's happening now is given that the Snyder cut is essentially like green light, go ahead. It's not exactly that he's going to finish up just what he shot. It's more that this is maybe part of why they're talking about doing a mini series, like whatever version of it that's longer is that I think what he's really going to do is they're going to shoot stuff to make this not the version that they went to Europe with, but the version they intended to go to Europe with. Oh. Cause like, so there's an original, original version mm -hmm. and then there's like the, the compromise version when they're like, you can't be so dark. Batman versus Superman was too divisive. But, th but this is what we'll let it's you shoot. Yeah. But now, and then it sounds like they fought with Jeff Johns the whole time when they're, and the studio about like, even the script they had agreed to, uh, we need more jokes. We need it to be more Marvel. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like he's going to roll it back to what they originally intended completely, which means there is stuff that he never shot, if that's what they're going to do. So there is going to be a bunch of pickup stuff they need to, to shoot. To, so, okay. And that is, at, at one point, that was part of the discussion is, uh, will, will they allow for a budget for more shoots? Yeah. And I mean, Lord, I hope so. I Lord, I hope so. I mean, if 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 they're green lighting the Batman to shoot, but only <laughs> stage stuff, that's perfect for Snyder because he literally just shot the entire thing in sound stages. <laughs> Almost, ex yeah, the vast majority, right? Like, yeah, yeah, the entire thing. Um, I mean, not the entire thing, but the vast majority. Yeah. Um, so, it's so that was fantastic. Like. If you're, if you're to do this, then just yeah. give the man whatever he needs. Yeah, and that's I think that's what makes sense of the thirty million plus it might take more money talk. When people are like, "But if you had a cut, why do they need so much money to finish it?" Because that makes no sense. Like if you're just finishing mm -hmm. up effects work and and maybe like a, a couple you know medium close shots of stuff you just didn't get, and it's like, no, he's literally going to shoot content that was in the first version, the first draft, not the the event, the compromise draft which would be awesome and explains things when people like when, this is a total justice league rant. Um, there was, and this might be complete rumor, but the idea that in the beginning of the movie, when Diana saves all the girl scouts mm. and she gets in there, there's a terrorist bomb and stuff and she chucks it out the top and everybody's fine. There were rumors uh, where people were like, well, in the original version, she fails and everybody dies. <laughs> and you're like, Really? That seems so hardcore. And it's like, that does sound now a lot like something they would do, especially because it sets up, it's kind of like Superman had the Capitol building or whatever where his trial was yeah. happening blow up around him and he gets yeah. to sit with the, the failure of not catching that sooner. Uh, the whole movie, <laughs> the whole movie of Batman vs. Superman is Batman in a dark place because he's sort of letting it, let himself fall to despair. Mm -hmm. And then Diana, kind of as the, the third of the Trinity, sort of has to sit in a dark place in order to get somewhere brighter, especially if we're going to go fight dark side. So it makes sense. I've never heard of this possibility, but now Ooh. I really I need it to happen. <laughs> and like originally I was like, oh, my God, because the scene seems so weird and out of tone with the rest of the movie because the movie starts pretty somber. And then she like just kind of, I'm a hero, remember? And, uh, and I was like, man, Joss must have shot that whole sequence. But then you can find all kinds of footage of Zach shooting that sequence. And I was like, what? And that's why it feels to me like the sequence was meant to end in death and fire. And the compromise was you can't have Wonder Woman failing to save a bunch of Girl Scouts in the beginning of this movie. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. fine, I guess uh, she succeeds. The bomb goes off outside instead of inside. Mm -hmm.
That's not that hard to roll back. Goodness. Goodness. Yes. Yeah. So the, I, I, I just, I, I hope that in, in this, um, in this attempt at redemption, mm -hmm. they, 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 uh, they being Warner Brothers allow uh, Zach the resources that he needs to accomplish exactly that. I mean, frankly, I feel like, like the Snyder Cut is the whole reason for HBO Max. Right now. Yeah, I don't no. see another reason to care. I don't, <laughs> Personally, I really, don't I really do not. I know, mm -hmm. I don't. And and you know, my my roommates. I have roommates. Mm -hmm. Um, they uh, they got HBO Max real early. Like they just they just went for wow. it. And I was like, okay, cool. And um and they they keep acquiring more properties every time. I I feel like every time I check in, there's yeah. an entire channel in HBO Max dedicated to x y or z <laughs> like an entire an entire library of a certain flavor of anime or mm. the whole the whole looney tunes canon oh cool oh that makes sense yeah. it kind of does it better um, be excuse me this dog has is is tapping the window he has to go pee so i'm gonna let him out all right <laughs> okay <laughs> so what what if we dig back into like the acting stuff what sure. how what do you think captures people from a as you not as a as a performer yet though we're gonna get there but like as an audience member like clearly batman's sunk his teeth in your soul and part of it might be like the gothic the romance the the music etc but like what do you think in general kind of opens that portal in people's souls um immediately the, the 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 words that pop into my mind are um authenticity and differentness ooh, ooh. and i like that me at five i knew nothing about anything i mean i still know nothing about anything <laughs> but um i was completely unaware mm. that you know them casting a comedian mm. as bruce wayne slash batman was different um, that was, oh, yeah. you know, that was just simply my introduction to this mythology, mm. but there was an authenticity to it. And there's, and I think that there's a reason why a lot of people stand the Michael Keaton, Bruce Wayne, <laughs> you know, and I still watch it. <laughs> he is just so bloody charming and just mm. available. <laughs> Interesting. Um, what do you think? What it would... What do you think ties into that authenticity and that availability, specifically that Keaton's doing? Oh, um, perhaps the um, the freedom, um, which <laughs> after you know years of therapy, uh, freedom is uh, something I, 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 I realize that we are all constantly after, um, whether it's in our relationships, everyday lives, our jobs, our craft. And mm -hmm. I feel like somehow, even in the giant machine of Warner Brothers and the brand of Batman and mm. all that, somehow they achieved freedom. And hmm. and he was able to do his thing. I mean, Tim Burton hmm. was still up and coming at the time, right? I mean, he was an animator. Yeah, he wasn't that big a deal, yeah. He wasn't. So I think it seems to me that in a way, um, they created it in a vacuum. Mm. Um, and some of my favorite, that, this is kind of like an, um, a paradigm that I really value because some of my favorites artistic ventures mm. uh the people involved feel like they were able to create it in a vacuum um mm. as opposed to like you know transparently and on this you know on the public stage yeah. um for example i think you might know that i'm a very big janet jackson fan yes <laughs> and um and previous to her to her control album she mm. uh was involved in projects that weren't really giving her 
a voice or mm. a, a, a platform to speak her truth. And then she, mm. um, she connected with uh, producers, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who okay. were producing Prince up until that time. Nice. <laughs> and, and they decided to abscond to Minneapolis. Mm. And they created the album Control, how they call it, in a vacuum. Hmm. No one involved. Um, I mean, and, and, and you know, hmm. I don't think Batman is necessarily on the same level. You know, Warner Brothers was a very big machine at that time, and of course, they had involvement. But yeah. it seems like they gave Burton a lot of trust, and Burton yeah. trusted Michael Keaton. Yeah, and and it does speak, I think, a little bit to a certain level of like. <laughs> They had just signed on to like, there's a, f I could be making this up, but there might be a feeling of like, they weren't sold that it was going to work anyway. So they were okay with weirder choices. Like that's why they're okay with like Tim Burton. He's sort of unproven and stuff, but okay, fine. He's got a look I can at least point to and say it was supposed to look like that. Mm. And like Keaton being like, bah, he's usually comedy. He's like, eh, okay, we're just trying something weird. And like, cause the whole idea, what's his fake? My uh, face. Well, Michael Uslan, the guy trying to get a serious Batman movie done for yeah. like 10 plus years, and they were finally yeah. doing it. But also the studio probably sitting there going, a serious Batman's probably not going to work, right? So I don't care if you hire a guy who's never done drama. Like, Not that he hasn't done drama, but not in a big public way. No. Yeah, that's very hmm. interesting. Yeah, oh, Michael Uslan, by the way. Like, <laughs> thank God for, for, for him. He is, he is championed. Hmm? For, uh, since the beginning, like the 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 respect Heard a lot. and and variety, and he has supported the variety, but but um, but he often comes back to 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 quality instead of um, uh, oh gosh, what would you call it? <laughs> the other stuff. <laughs> spectacle. spectacle. Okay. Like, spectacle. I think he prefers quality versus spectacle. Sure, sure. And he has championed it um, all along. So, yeah, what a cool guy. Hmm. So it seems like there's something yeah. there with... What? What? I'm sorry, you were saying? <laughs> I was going to say, it seems like there's something there, definitely, around that idea of creating a bubble, specifically to produce things that have... have like, the, the thing that goes through my head a lot when people are specifically asking you about, like something you're writing or something you're putting together that is a creative project and then mm -hmm. they want to see it. And then there are times in that process where I'm very protective not to do that. Mm -hmm. Like, like when they're asking, I'm now regretting mentioning it exists because that's usually the first thing people say. And, and it feels like a, like a little sapling. Like if it's a tiny seed that's barely sprung uh, sprouted. And if you put it and you give it too much water, you give it too much sunlight, it's just going to die. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the same with creative projects that if somebody comes in here and it's not necessarily intended to be malicious, but it's like people have a hard time, it seems, not giving their critical judgment on anything they see ever. So why would it be different for a creative thing? So if you do show them something in this embryonic phase, they're just like, oh, that sucks. Or, oh, that sounds cool. But I, what if this X, Y, Z? And you're like, fuck, this is not what it was supposed to be happening. Get out of my lab. Get out of my workshop. Like, yeah. Yeah. It speaks to that protective, like you have to bubble it. Otherwise, forces that don't intend to be destructive can so super be destructive. I couldn't agree more. And the, those forces do inevitably find it, uh, end up finding um, a voice. Um, unless you're really um, sort of um, uh, vigilant. In, 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 and you're sort of really focused on 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 yeah. what on what you're doing, and you might still be very vigilant and very focused on um on the pro uh, on the, the the project, and and still uh, some of that can sort of um, seep in. Um, I mean, and we're human. <laughs> we're human. Like you know, you uh, you you allow for certain voices to speak into your life. Sure. And I, I have to imagine that all along the way in some of our favorite 
things. Uh, so some, some of them are, are, are favorite um, albums or films or plays or TV shows that has mm-hmm. happened. And the result is, um, is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the Snyder cut. That's why I'm so excited <laughs> about the Snyder cut. It's like, let's get some pure, please. Yes. I, I often rage against oh. the, um, the man, <laughs> of Warner Brothers during the time mm. that these projects came out. Which mandate? What are you talking about? Oh, the, 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 the management at Warner Brothers. Oh, management. Um, yeah, management. Sorry, gotcha. not mandate. Management um, during, you know, uh, BBS, uh, Justice League, um, Suicide Squad. Oof. It's quite, quite well documented. By the way, do you think an ire Air cut is gonna happen. <laughs> An air cut. I air air is that how it's pronounced? I, th- I think it is. I'm not positive, to be fair. Air, uh, I think that cut's gonna happen because it seems to be sort of building momentum. I would like it to happen, but I absolutely want it to come out after Zach's movie. Because I don't what I don't need is air's cut coming out and it's not any better. And that takes the wind out of the sails of a lot of people anticipating and talking about Zack's movie. So like, I want to see whatever version he has, because I've seen the original, I've seen the theatrical and I've seen the director's cut. So Mm -hmm. it's a little odd that whatever this is, is not the director's cut. (laughs) Uh, Director's cut's trash. Like it just starts two different ways. And like, there's four different beginnings. Like it's, it doesn't seem like a coherent structure. It seems like they just Frankensteined a bunch of stuff together. So. They both look like they were edited by a trailer company. Because they were, yeah. Because they were. <laughs> so I want to see it, and I think it will happen, actually. I don't, because it doesn't sound like it would take much of anything in the way of money to make it happen. And HBO Max needs content, so if there's any... They might, they might as well. Interest, yeah. Let uh, Leto have his day because apparently it's a Joker movie if they add all of that content. I'm excited if there I, again. Why is that not in the director's cut? If there's legitimately that much because there's more Joker in the director's cut than there was in the theatrical. Mm-hmm. But it's it's weird to me that there's substantially more that he still didn't put back in. And if that's the case, I super want to see that. I liked Leto's Joker so. I did too. I I, I really did not need all of the, um, um, I don't think we all needed to be let in on the shenanigans of how he got there, if that mm. makes sense. Even though we are, we are a, a culture so saturated and behind the scenes and method and this and that, okay. but misconstrue it. Even myself, as, as a participant in the arts, I'm like, I, please, I, Granted, I clicked on everything that allowed me to be oversaturated <laughs> with how he got there, so that's on me. Yeah. But um, but I I I didn't need that. If you remove that, yeah. Leto's Joker was quite um quite unique. He made it his own. Are you talking about like him sending people rats and stuff and like and and that's exactly and what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Like was that yeah, was have- bigger than the actual film? Yeah, I suppose. Which is because, like, those actions weren't intended to be part of the narrative as as witnessed by the audience, right? Like, they're extra narrative. They're intended to be the process they're going through. It's supposed to be in the bubble. It's yes. supposed to be in that motherfucking bubble. In the bubble. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you ever or, or uh, recently been in, like, an outdoor performance? Not, like, recently because, you know, COVID, but in recent history been at say like a like a festival type setting where people aren't here to see the show to like sit in a blackened box and watch what's on screen or, or rather on stage but instead it's sort of like a, almost like an outdoor concert series or a beer fest like there are stages and people wander through Is that anything? are you talk well okay are you talking about um like immersive theater um, are you talking about theater? Or are you talking about a festival? I situation? am talking about theater. But, I mean, I feel like the immersive theater t- tends to, there needs to be, like, these people have specifically come to be in the immersive theater experience, yeah? Correct. Yes, okay. there's, there is um, consent. Absolutely. <laughs> As a part of the social contract. Well, but 
so I guess I'm looking for, you tell me, I'm looking for a context in which there is a theater show occurring, there is a narrative unraveling or, or come, uh, unfolding, but there hasn't been as tight a container around the viewing experience of it. And that's why my mind went to like, you know, an outdoor festival where you'd have many stages across a bunch of space. I don't know the last time I've been to anything like that, but do you know what I'm talking about? Um, well, okay, anything? Let, me, let, me, let me speak to this and, and, and see if, um, if I'm understanding correctly. Uh, uh, the La Jolla Playhouse does mm -hmm. a without walls festival every oh. other year. Okay. This might be um, that's what, yeah, shorthand is WOW Festival, but okay. it's uh, an acronym, Without Walls Festival. And their entire goal is to, and they often bring together, I could only be guessing at the number of uh, production companies that they bring together, but they come from all over, not just the nation, but um, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they bring their site-specific shows to mm -hmm. San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the first few festivals were centered around the UCSD, uh, which is where La Jolla Playhouse is, uh, centered around the UCSD campus. And then, sure. um, and I've, I, I've taken part in three of them. And um, last year in October, I believe, um, they centered it around Liberty Station. And- Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went yeah. to this one. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you did. Okay. Remember the, the, the two person show? Um, yeah. Um, we did in the brewery, me and uh, Caroline Keeler. Yeah. A brilliant actress. Um, anyway, so yes. Um, okay. I feel like uh, the La Jolla Playhouse has done a great service to the, the, um, the theater world by, by bringing these uh, collections of projects together because often they're you know it's like it can be circus it can be dance it can be entirely you know dramatic and scripted interesting um and it uh, as a as a performer i yeah. have grown the most in these situations because you really have wow. to be present <laughs> right that makes sense yeah you have to be very present if you are including the um, the, the variable of audience participation or non-participation which is often the case <laughs> well i think wait, okay i'm gonna try and remember what i was gonna say i think the thing with that because it was super cool it was super cool um but i think there was an odd it was, it was hard to learn the grammar of where you were and were not expected to inject yourself as an audience member at all. Oh yeah, that stresses me the fuck out, by the way. <laughs> it really does. I don't necessarily enjoy being an interactive audience member because <laughs> I'm for the same thing that you just cited. Like, it's just like, uh, where do I say something? Am I going to mess them up? Exactly. I felt like I wanted to, but then it was almost like I felt like I was picking up on cues I am in specifically sort of not supposed to talk right now. And then in retrospect, you're like, no, I think that was just, they could tell I wasn't going to and then just went straight ahead and railroaded it a little bit. Like, so I guess, I don't know. I think it would have been cooler. I don't know how to fix this off the top of my head, but if there was some sort of, intuitive understanding or explicit selling of some kind that would make it easier to be like, no, 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 please talk. That's what I want you, that's why this is different. That's why we're at a table with two people and a performer instead of in a, you know, a theater and a stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, there are situations where it is made abundantly clear what the rules and boundaries are and still Excuse yeah. me. As as a perf as um, I don't think you can be prepared enough as a performer for whatever comes your way, and as an audience member, it just never really seems appropriate, <laughs> unless you just have this burning desire to yeah. speak to what happens. And sometimes people do; they have a burning desire to speak 
to exactly what you present to them. Most of the time people are like, what do you want from me? I paid my money for this it's, ticket. They deliberately want a passive experience. Like yes. I, I don't want you to hand me the ingredients and I cook the food. Like I want to just come to a restaurant and eat food. Yeah. Yeah. So I, feels, I um yeah. so I, I and I, I think that that is a a very worthy um question um <laughs> to continually explore um with festivals like that mm -hmm. with immersive theater um and i love i love immersive theater i i did a a, a two-person play mm -hmm. um for the san diego fringe festival um a few years ago and then we took it to the tucson um but it, the 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 basic premise was me and my life partner female and mm -hmm. um we refused to get married for whatever reason but we had this child and we were raising this child um but uh it's a 45 minute play okay. um where the beginning the audience is um welcomed in we rented an airbnb downtown oh, okay yeah yeah. now oh, i remember so, this all right yeah i didn't see and, it but i wanted to <laughs> and everyone um everyone was uh, like a like a dinner party guest so we would invite you in and you know i i started i kicked off the show and i i had made all of these hors d'oeuvres and whatnot and um i'm apologizing for my my partner's lateness and the moment that she arrives the play starts and all of a sudden then you are voyeurs and for 45 minutes oh. you are privy to our conversations we even um at some point things get frisky and we want to have sex and the, the 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 audience members would follow us to the bedroom where we would start to do it but then of course an argument would ensue and so the sex would not happen we'll and then we would move back i loved that experience so much um so site specific and when boundaries get blurred yeah. I think it's a cool experience, but I don't know that I would have loved it as an audience <laughs> member. So I <laughs> did you have, I mean, like when, so were they explicitly told Yeah. that once she comes in, like, don't, because you're setting up an expectation almost at the beginning of like, this is collaborative, this is interactive, this is improvish of you just being a human and you may or may not know I'm in the show. I assume they do know. They do. In the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, okay, that guy's one of the actors. But like, that's inviting interaction. And then it they were explicitly told that once she shows up, shut the fuck up and just watch and follow us. Was not that explicit. You just sort of have to intuit it. Just sort of and there were times when this, like maybe a story she was telling would spill out into her going and sitting on someone because they are yeah. dinner party guests. But it's sort of like it would move the oh. narrative moved in and out of flashbacks and in the moment and we're alone and all of a sudden your dinner parties guests That's again so That's yeah complicated it was complicated and it was fascinating as a performer yeah in to cool, to though. display that and 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 inform i mean every single crowd was so different yeah um so I, I mean, I love it. It's a it's cool. a challenge, and it's very it's very um, amoebic. Like it's very fluid. <laughs> I don't think so. I, what I was trying to capture, though, I'm trying to find a situation in which there isn't so much of a container around the performance. And even okay. these two events, like the Airbnb thing and the Liberty Station immersive theater stuff, like the people there are still specifically aware they're going to be kind of immersed in part of or witnessing a show right like there there is a container of the airbnb is the container right mm -hmm. so that is very much like a dynamic version of theater that's that's uh, intimate and content wise is flipping around if you're doing like flashbacks but also acknowledging that they are present current dinner guests etc like that's cool i mm -hmm. i really wish i'd seen this um but that's a container. And like in the immersive theater at Liberty Station, it was also very much a container. Like you guys had taken over particular chunks of the space. Mm -hmm. And the only people in the space were the performers mm -hmm. and the audience. Give and then you also had real time guests of the brewery 
Yes. Who were like looking around going, what the fuck is that? Yeah. <laughs> Wandering into a corner and going, ah, why, why, why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm trying to like, is there, is there an experience you've been a part of where you're basically doing theater that could be presently ignored by the people present? Is that anything you've taken part in? Like a music festival where the band's playing, but nobody like has, like nobody's, there are people in front of the stage listening, but there are plenty of other people just like, whatever, it's like ambient music. I don't care about what's happening over there. Um, okay, that is much clearer. And I want to say that I okay. don't think I don't think I have, which is, uh, it, okay. now that you're explaining that, is such a precise experience. Well, I'm trying to get this di differentiation, but I, I need the example to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, it's okay, if you haven't, that's fine. Yeah, I don't think I've had the pleasure of performing <laughs> while being ignored. Um, <laughs> and it's an I, I mean, amazing experience musicians um especially a part of festivals um of course experience that all the time especially if there's various stages and it's like there's this plethora of options yeah. um yeah i don't think i've i've taken part in such a thing but you know it must be <laughs> fascinating <laughs> To actively be performing and hating every moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Why did you know, I sign up for this? It, it could be. What you're describing might be a very mm. big part of the future. Um, because it's, it's, it's actively changing right before our eyes. Sure. Um, and, and, and I saw this. Um, this social media post recently by a Broadway producer. Oh. And I thought this, this I'm, I'm not gonna quote them directly, but I, I thought, <laughs> okay. I feel like um, the, the I, I really, um, I got the intention behind it, which is that mm. um, the theater world um, it should not endeavor to re open or re anything that what we are moving into the air that we are moving into has to be entirely a new construct um, um yes because a lot a lot of a lot theaters the, are fucked right now <laughs> what's that theaters are fucked right now totes yeah absolutely Movies, live concert venues they're all and you know, if, if, I, if I can speak to to the my pride in being a part of the theater community mm -hmm. right now, there are, I'm sure. Okay, I feel like there are a lot of professions that might relate to this, but in, in terms of like theater performers, yeah, we are a tribe of people whose identities have been intrinsically um, tied to our profession and craft often the majority of our lives. And when that practice mm -hmm. gets completely pulled from us, um, it has been traumatizing. But in the face of a pandemic, theater people have been on the front line saying, no, we're not going, we don't need to be gathering and in an enclosed space before we have solved this issue. We don't want right, right, right. we don't want less people. We don't want people sitting in seats six feet apart. And it's like, how do you do that? You're not even going to break even. How do you do a production that way? No. It's depressing to see that on a <laughs> on a normal day, you know. Let alone organized and uh, no. So I'm very proud of theater people that have been pushing for um, for waiting. Ah, and okay. so we are ready to actually do it. But also, we're all dying inside. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, but doing stuff that breaks the box and that, that is trying to be something else, especially in the interim, makes sense. Like, it's cool. Yeah. It's not the same thing, but I guess, like, obviously, definitionally, it wouldn't be. So It wouldn't be. Um, uh, and I actually, uh, a group of friends... 
of of mine, including the artistic director of a theater company in town. Uh -huh. um, we did a play last summer and we all got, you know, really close. And these are some of the best people in the biz. Cool. Um, and uh, this particular artistic director is uh -huh. just dying to do something outdoors and is like, you know, uh -huh. begging begging the mayor of that particular city to give us rights to um a certain space that appeals to us so that we can do something huh. asap um a lot of that is because he <laughs> he we are all just we're, we're all chomping at the bit to create and to do what we do and to bring people together um and and to create a next step of community safely so that we can then get back to um you know stages right we love lights we love good lighting we love stages <laughs> we love setting we love costumes um so doing something outside um yeah. is going to be going back to basics but we're storytellers and we will thrive wherever you put us so do you think there would be a qualitative difference? Or maybe what do you think would be the difference between something, because I'm, I'm just going to ask you what I was going to ask you. I, I haven't found the example. But the difference between something with a, a tight intent container of like, you know, it is a black box theater or it's, you know, some elaborate theater, but everybody's here specifically for the show. The performers are here to perform this piece. The people here are specifically to see whatever it is that's going to happen on this stage mm -hmm. and in this place versus something with a looser container. And the closest thing we have is like the interact, the immersive theater stuff, which I, I would argue is still pretty contained, partly, at least like 80%. But what do you think the difference is in the, in the creation of that sort of authenticity we were talking about earlier? Like the actual escapist connective art? of it or is there is there no difference well, um if, if maybe you can help me out with the definition sure. of the um the container so oh. um with the two-person play i just told you about there was this yeah. contract and you were a part of this narrative but mm -hmm. to to sort of open up the the container makes me think of um almost like uh like a Halloween um, trails and uh, <laughs> sort of pads, right? Where, okay. where there's like a loop, but not necessarily a narrative. And it's, hmm. you know, that's the, old, that's the closest thing I can think to it because um, Ion Theater. Um, yeah. Which gosh. one's Ion? What's that? Which one's Ion? They did the Airbnb? Uh, no, no, no. Ion Theater, oh. they have recently left to New York, but they were, uh, for the better part of a decade, uh, one of the, the the highest quality, most respected smaller theater companies wow. in San Diego. Oh, okay, um, okay. Yeah, like cool. they were a smaller theater company, but biggest and best stars, um, including me in 2007, um, <laughs> went and worked uh, with them on smaller productions. And they, um, around that time, they did a production of a play called uh, um, Marat Saad. Okay. And they did it in a warehouse, mm. very much in the style of like a Halloween um, at Universal Studios or what we do in Balboa Park. Yeah. Horror Nights. Um, on yeah, trail, yeah. Or it's like a walkthrough and the, mm. the scenarios are in a loop yeah. and it's not in it's not um interactive. Right. Um it's almost like an art gallery. Ha! <laughs> With little loops as the yeah, pieces. Where the narrative exists, um, but you are sort of hosted through. Yeah. I'm not so I, <laughs> that's the closest I can <laughs> to what you're suggesting I, i'm either missing it entirely okay. or that's as close as my imagination can get uh, well I'm, i i don't want to get i don't know why i'm so interested in this but i don't want to get lost no, on it either explore it i want to get as, as to what you're saying 
I guess I'm trying to, as I'm like sculpting the idea in my head, it's like, what do you feel the difference? No, let me, okay, let me just talk about it. It feels like to me, there's a qualitative difference between you've, you've all kind of created a space where you know this performance thing will occur. Sure. And people are here specifically to do the performing and here, people are here to specifically do the observing or the witnessing. And versus a scenario where what I would imagine you would mean by immersive theater, but I feel like is a little bit different than what happened, where it's like, pretend you were to go to a crowded bar and nobody knows there's going to be a bar. maybe like four people out of the 25 here know that there is a narrative experience uh -huh. that's going to be occurring that is not real in a, in a sense that's different from your lived life. So like these people are going to be performing, most people present are not going to have that context. So they're going to either interact or ignore or observe from afar as they would maybe at a music festival where you're like, yes, I understand you're playing music, but I am here to get drunk or something. So it feels like in that scenario, it would be interestingly more difficult <laughs> to inhabit this character and this space and the story you know you're here to tell in the face of there being almost no container. Yes. Like that shared space of everybody knows that there's like sort of this sacred magical work that's being done here. You're trying to do it in the face of all that sun, like too much sunlight on the sapling I was talking about earlier. Like you're almost doing it in the face of critical and real world context, which is almost just like being a different person, I guess. I guess what I'm talking about is like, what do you think it would be like to be schizophrenic and pretend you're somebody else for a significant amount of time for no reason other than to do it? Yes. That's, that's not much of a question. But so no, no, no I, well, I mean, uh, um, uh, I can speak to it in this way. Because um, okay. now I think I, I, I get it. And okay. um, I am in my own life mm. um, a terrible liar and <laughs> the most god-awful prankster. I should be last on the list of anyone who wants to accomplish such a covert mission. Um, ah, okay. Because I, I'm squeamish under those circumstances. I mean, it's just like I don't want uh, to do it. <laughs> I, I don't. And I, I, I'm, it, um, there's lots of examples, I think, mm. in our oh. pop culture because it's um, candid camera, right? Okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, people, y I you know, and every single culture um, around the world oh. has programming like this and you watch it and I am... I just, I squirm as I watch it. I'm like, oh my God, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, You've broken the deal. You can't do this yeah, with yeah. one person not knowing. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, you know, it's nice as long as no one's oh. safety is in question. I think um, the, the, you know, the, the result is often quite satisfying and everyone's cool. Yeah. But, uh, but in the moment of the unknowing, um, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of those situations right. and yeah. And I, 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 I probably will never voluntarily take part <laughs> in, in such a thing, but you know, never Fair. say never, but I, I think I right. finally understand what you were talking about and yeah, it, it, it exists and I'm sure right. it has a, gr a grand purpose to test us. No, maybe I think mean, there, there's an NBC show, isn't it? There's an NBC show where they um where they get really serious about it. Like they'll put like in a coffee shop and they'll completely cast all of the uh, the patrons. I'm already interested. I have no yeah. idea what you're talking about. I'm trying to remember the title of the show, and maybe I've 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 misspoken by saying it's NBC. But yeah, um, they'll you know, and they'll um an actor will um, be talking about um maybe like being abused or they seem underage and they're they're talking about you know dating an older Yikes. guy and some some clueless person will be sitting next to them the only person that is not really cast yeah and 
cameras are rolling and we're all watching them, Oof. you know, make their decide whether do I help this person? Do I turn this person in? Do I give them advice? Do I keep to myself? Interesting. So, uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, this, this structure, this framework, uh, <laughs> is <laughs> very loose, very frightening. <laughs> Well, I think I just figured out, because like all of those scenarios are predicated on one thing, kind of. Punked, Candid Camera, whatever this show's called. Like it's, the last one's a little different, but it's kind of predicated on the notion of like, oh, what are they going to do? What foolishness yeah. are they get? They're going to embarrass themselves or do something ridiculous or you're just provoking in a reaction like anger or, or sadness or, or what. You're almost that last one, like asking how moral of a is this person? Yes. Like, yeah. Catch and them being a human. How, like, and who knows how many, how many of those they said they cycled through to show us the person yeah. who witnesses this and says, "No, I'm going to speak up." Yeah. Or I'm going to go out of my way to protect this to person. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I feel like the 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 the. the it has some kind of a function, but I am a wuss, and I, would, I don't know that I would ever take part in such a thing. Well, but okay, but that's interesting, because why, as somebody who's such a performer, why do you think it makes you cringe at the idea of doing that? Especially if it's not about making somebody look foolish. I get, well, no. No, no, it's it's a it's a great question. I just um, uh, I, there's <laughs> just certain experiences mm. um that are performative that make my the corners of my lips curl, <laughs> and I give myself away, and I have a lot of tells. Oh. As, and also, are we uh, performing a public service, which is the case in some of these examples, okay. and in others, it is it is pure. Look, I I have I have zero desire to take part in pranks. Right. But if you give okay. me a context where I am supposedly uh, fulfilling a public service. <laughs> that would that would probably play more into my identity as a blue collar artist. I obviously, um, while I rarely work for free, I right. don't do it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been doing it to get rich, and um, gotcha. and the older the older I get, the mm. more I value my anonymity, and I oh. the more I see that in certain circumstances. Um, fame and uh, notoriety can be toxic sure, it, sure. Help, it can help work become more, more prolific yeah. but uh, it's kind of like the roll of the die you know right, right. Um, so I identify as a blue collar artist and I I like my 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 work to have a function yeah. um, so I guess maybe getting down to that what would make it cringeworthy if it serves a purpose and if it serves my purpose because mm. a prank can serve a purpose but it will <laughs> sure. serve the purpose of someone's either amusement or revenge um so <laughs> within within the content within the framework of my family full of pranksters i always say i don't want anything to do with your plan <laughs> fair i want nothing to do with your plan don't give me any lines or dialogue <laughs> um, because I will fail because I'm I I, I buckle. Uh, if that makes any sense, I don't I don't know how. Well, I guess that's what we're doing is we're sort of uh, dissecting why. <laughs> <laughs> yes, why? Why? Not that like I'm not in love with pranks either, but it, it and I think there's a distinction here because it's not. And I know I guess what I'm talking about is very specific and a little weird because like where else do you see this? But. I'm trying to think of it. Okay, it's, can I, can can I give you yeah. an example of maybe yeah. a real a real world uh, situation where this has taken place? Sure. Um, my uh, my archive is going to fail me, but um, what was the uh, the Ben Affleck film where 
they go, um, they're in like the Middle East and they pretend to be a, um, a film production company. Argo? Argo. Okay. So is your question maybe living in that world of like um, people who are not privy to what you're doing? It is a full on production. There are roles yeah. and there, there is a narrative um, and maybe it serves a purpose. I mean, oddly, I think it's distinctly different in that what I'm thinking about is not, because like in that scenario, it's the purpose of, of making sure the authorities don't find them out, right? Like it's making sure they don't get arrested or murdered. Yeah. So it's a fiction to serve that purpose. Like if they could do it an easier way, they probably would have, right? Yeah. This is more, the thing that keeps coming to mind, and I don't know if this will be useful, is a version of playing D and D that you may be privy to because it's it's how I tend to play and it's and it tends to rub other people the wrong way sometimes. Oh, where, I know how to play D and D. Where you set up a world and then you're playing to whatever sort of almost creatively artistically sparks you, versus there being a particular purpose. Like typically, there is sort of a narrative. They're guide rails. They're, you know, it's on rails a little bit in like D&D &D or something. You're expected to, once you hear about like uh, the guy who's been kidnapped, to go try and save the person who's been kidnapped for money or something. But part of me is very interested in spending time just very much improv with people in a bar that has nothing to do with whether or not we're going to go save some guy who's been kidnapped. And it's kind of like that, but real life. Like you're in this, say, bar performing a narrative that no one knows is a narrative for no purpose other than to do it. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck we're talking about now. I just well, think I've gotten down to what I meant. <laughs> okay. That's hardcore. And I think what you're describing to me has been something that I have always uh, admired about different artistic mediums especially mm. music where you can jam sure almost anywhere yeah. um and um as a visual artist That's you can pick up a sketchbook or if you have whatever um uh, materials that you need to sort of mm. jam as a visual artist in that moment you can do that and yeah. that is one of the things that uh when it comes to performance art yeah it is is extremely different because you have these different elements that you kind of need for theater. You need the observer, you need the performer. <laughs> um, everything else you can sort of um, improvise if uh, if yeah. if needs be. But what you're talking about, and, and let's let's take you got it. I think I just figured out why the hell I want to talk about this so much. So let me what. What do you think it takes to create a moment and the kind of moment that, let's say, in a conventional play is just sort of a moment of authenticity and something where, like, the story and the performance and everything is really contacting the audience? That's, like, the normal context. And maybe why I'm so interested in this line of thinking is I think a hypercharged version of that would be what you might need in this sort of real world, nobody knows it's a performance thing, to grab someone's attention so profoundly that they now become an observer when they didn't even know they were near a performance to begin with. Does that make sense? Uh, what does it take yes. for an authentic moment in a show? And then... Do you think that's the same thing that would literally like entrance someone in real life to participate, even though they didn't know there was something to participate in? <laughs> I, I keep, I keep, I keep thinking about that the 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 um the elasticity clause in the social contract you're you are describing. Wait, what? Uh, okay, talk more yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, 
you they wouldn't know that they're an observer so there's a particular social contract there whether you're at a bar let's say yeah. that so you yeah. are just near each other doing your own thing then the circumstances change yes there is now a scenario that be some sort of like portal opening yeah but so once the scenario begins to bloom you have yes. a choice do i engage do i not but at that point i think if you as the performer have done your job properly you have completely mm -hmm. split the focus of the people around you the people who can potentially become enraptured in your scenario what do you mean split their focus i mean if this is happening let's say you know it's 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 an argument okay. right between a couple or okay. i mean or a drug deal or a boss letting go an employee and this is literally the worst thing that could happen in their life at the time but this okay. dialogue this um, this exchange is going to, I mean, I've, I've, I've been around, I think we all have real world scenarios where you start to hear this happen and you're like, Oh my God. <laughs> and so what I'm, what I'm exploring is that then your focus becomes split because you are there either purposefully, purposefully getting trashed by yourself or you have company. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then this starts happening adjacent to you. Right. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll make I statements. For me, <laughs> immediately my focus becomes split. So. I see. Okay, okay. Now I know what you mean by split. All right. Well, one half of you is focused on whatever you were doing before. The other is now actively engaged in whatever thing is occurring yeah. over here. Yeah. Okay. So I guess what I'm asking is, how would you, <laughs> how would you literally take it from half to full, fully eng engrossed in this versus whatever the hell you were doing over here with your drinking with your friends. My, on my honest response would be if, if, yeah. if one of those people turned to me and said, <laughs> I'm sorry, can, can, this person is firing me for X, Y, and Z, or can you believe this person is dumping me even though they did x y and z i just i need to know that i'm not crazy what would you do if you were in my shoes i mean engage them uh, which i i know for a fact in this world that crazier things have happened people sure. turn to um and, and look for support it happens <laughs> look for support for support hmm and then it, so then it becomes like sort of the, you've been socially um, enlisted. You've been drafted by Ooh, the that's person. Wonderful phraseology, yes. Like, get in here. <laughs> and now, and now, and now it's more socially awkward to back out almost than it would be to, to, do the, to go with it. I would hang on to that phraseology, socially enlisted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? If they, I feel like that is going to be, mm. if you are going to further explore this kind of work, <laughs> even, hypo even hypothetically. Start <laughs> doing this in a year. Even hypothetically, becoming socially enlisted is an action, it, it seems to me, uh, seems to me the, the, the most apt description of what is happening. <laughs> Um, because, because, and I'm also relating to it um, outside of this uh, performance framework. I yeah. feel like I have been socially enlisted a number of times in things where I'm like, I've been Shanghai. I had a point, <laughs> I had a thing. I was and doing now, stuff. And now I've been socially enlisted uh, in this thing. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that ties or connects at all to what makes a moment in a show really sing? like really get people. Oh, I kind of love where you're going with this because um, now that I really think about it, if I've done my job mostly as a, as a writer, 
Okay. Yeah. I think this is sort of the hat that I'm wearing as a writer. If mm. I've done my job, I want these people to feel emotion, um, socially enlisted <laughs> in, in, in my agenda, which is not usually all me setting up shop on myself. Usually, yeah. um, the humor might be specific, but the message, um, mm. is I think one that is usually, um, anthropological and philanthropic, right? The, 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 the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm really pushing, um, a narrative, a script, a show, or, or if I'm directing something, I'm trying to find my way into how this can, um, again, blue collar artist, how can I make things better? Mm. Even, even if the vehicle is like raunchy or vile or super R rated. Right. 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 Um, with it, that audience, how can I, how can I improve our, um, our situation? Hmm. Um, so would you uh, say that that's an important piece of it that like because before you were saying escapism for stories mm -hmm. is that part number two to um facilitate change uh okay so um, <laughs> yes great thank you for for bringing up the distinction uh so uh, our friend from high school david vaughn and myself we yep. um we wrote um uh, directed and produced a play in 2017 called The Cat Lady. Yep. That was leading up, we started writing it two years before, about a year and a half before, leading up to an election year. Okay. And we yeah. most definitely decided that our, um, that, that, that this particular project um, was not going to be political in any way because we okay. were being... If that was coming at us from every single direction. I was searching my mind for how Cat Lady related to the election, but I, it's good to find out that that wasn't the intent at all. All right. Well, it was <laughs> why I couldn't find it. <laughs> it was our antidote. Yeah. It was sense. our antidote. There was pure escapism. And we mm. summoned, um, for us, um, the um, um, com uh, sort of um, comedic comfort food. Mm. And we try to, to access um, sort of um, styles that uh, that always that 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 informed our humor, and so that's what Cat Lady ended up being um, was pure escapism. Cool. Um, but um, <laughs> but but so the antithesis yes. to that. Um, would be a piece where you are speaking to actual issues that are happening. Well, that I don't know have happened historically or present, or mm -hmm. that if you are, you know, projecting into the future, and this is where you think, you know, you're still um, trying to get people to 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 to, to go along on that. Mm -hmm. um, what was the what was the phraseology that I love that I've already forgotten? Uh, socially enlisted. Socially enlisted, yes. <laughs> and I and I and I believe Fair. that if you if you are if you are able to socially enlist your audience, right. Um, right. of course you. But I mean, that's what politicians are trying to do. They're trying to socially enlist people into ideology. True, and because yeah. art. Sometimes we do that, and um, and even with escapism, if you are if people love your form of escapism you have mm. successfully socially enlisted them right even if it has nothing to do with um racism or equality yeah. or the pandemic or really whatever yeah um if they if they go in that direction you've socially enlisted them so yes <laughs> um i believe that that helps um a piece sing fair enough do you think it's important like, do you think you can have great art that doesn't necessarily have anything it's trying to socially enlist you in? Uh, yes, it certainly exists. Um, look at, you know, fiddle players um, working <laughs> for tips. 
outside Fair. of riches, riches and Hillcrest or um, I'm thinking more narrative, but okay. <laughs> But yes, I mean, you know, the, they're they're on the front lines of people who are uninterested in you being socially enlisted. They're literally just putting it out there and they're saying, walk by me, ignore me, or mm. or or give me, you know, give me give me some coin, give me some attention. Um uh, so that that's one aspect um that doesn't necessarily require social and um enlisting mm -hmm. uh but you're saying um uh, more narrative um yeah like a play a no, movie a show i yeah no i don't think because also ultimately it is a business and um and if you fail at socially enlisting your people <laughs> your audience on some level then you probably are not going to um be able to continue to spread your message well now it sounds like we're definitely using social enlisting as like a um they're on board like not necessarily on board with a particular formulated uh thing you want them to do or direction you want them to go but as long as they are on board the <laughs> Like if the narrative is a car, you're not saying you've enlisted them to go to the destination, but you have gotten them in the car. Mm -hmm. Did that help? Yes. Did that clarify versus not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it definitely did. Like um, I finally, this, uh, this past week, okay. um, started Westworld. Oh. Oh, finally. so good. I've seen, I've seen episodes. I've seen scenes here and there. Um, uh, but all right. But what, what launched me into it was yeah. uh, realizing that Jonathan Nolan, yeah, right, is into it was the the creator directed the first episode. Um, and talk, Lisa Joy, talking it's, with a friend, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. So <laughs> the first episode, and honestly, I feel like it. Um, every episode. I feel like it's like three or four hours long. I just sort of just disappear into it. I can't believe it's taken me a week cool. to watch three episodes and I'm exhausted. <laughs> and I don't, I can't quite put my finger on what they're saying about humanity. Oh, but, okay. but I'm on board. Like I'm in. <laughs> it's fantastic. Like I, mm, I need you to finish it immediately so I can talk to you about it. Like, <laughs> yes, I, I'm going to try and and <laughs> and, and rush this uh, um, rush the process, um, but it's just it's it's so it's so plush it's so luxurious and I mean you've got they use Anthony Hopkins so economically. True. I I assume to not overwork an elderly man, even though <laughs> it's like sort of molded around him. Uh, <laughs> he looks like he's in decent shape. I think he's okay. Like. He does. I think he plays older he than work. He yeah, I think so. I hope so. I hope he still rides his motorcycles cross country like he used oh, to. Geez. Oh wow. I did not know that. Um but um but I'm on board. Like I I'm just I'm super enraptured by whatever this this is. So then what do you think it is that enraptured you? Like I know you kind of just said I don't know, but yeah, there was something yeah, that spoke to you in a way that's that's past just it being Jonathan Nolan, <laughs> right? Jonathan Nolan brought me, and Anthony brought me to the table. But what is it that keeps me there? Um, perhaps it's this um, difficult to distinguish element of of a project knowing itself. That doesn't mean that they show you all their cards from the get go, but I, um, it's, it's, um, and it's difficult as a, as, as a writer of a project to distinguish what it is you're trying to say. Sure. Because you will be asked so many times. <laughs> True. So many times. Um, and um, mm. 
and 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 I just I get this sense that Westworld knows what it is about, and I am here. I am here for that journey, right? Um, now this mm. is part. This is my part of the social contract that I'm like, okay, I don't have all the answers. You're not force feeding them to me, um, but but I think that you know yourself enough. That's really interesting. Like, so it's it, the sense that you're in capable hands, that there is something capable. to this. Yeah. And not just yeah. like artistically competent, like, oh, it's shot nice and the actors are good at what they do, but instead just like the story itself clearly seems to be going somewhere, though you don't know where that is. Mm hmm. Hmm. Everything you just said. <laughs> do you feel like life is like that? Oh, hell no. No, <laughs> no. At least not for me. It's not. Well, but linear. what about? I'm not saying I do either. But so the moments of your life that though like have been sort of transcendent or entrancing. Would you say that they're they share anything in common with that? Hmm. And it could be any. I, the answer doesn't have to be yes. <laughs> I don't know that I know that I don't know that it like um does or has um certainly um no I mean I don't know if this is um answering to it there's a cyclical nature to um to the lessons that I learn in that sometimes I learn I have to learn them over and over and over again <laughs> Um, and the consequences become more severe. Um, oh, God. There is a linear um, narrative to, um, to that sequence. Yeah. But um, I don't know, maybe it's just the COVID quarantine talking, but no, I don't believe that, um, that life has sort of the same, um, that I, I don't feel like I am in the capable hands of a storyteller <laughs> in life. <laughs> oh my gosh in fact now that you mention it i would do anything to dive into the west world world <laughs> at least there's no virus there <laughs> absolutely yeah hmm. yeah <laughs> have you had a time where you did feel like you artistically or not or just like your life lived that you felt you were experiencing something sort of transcendent or analogous to like a really juicy moment in a show something where the meaning of the, of this moment kind of extended beyond the specifics like it's just two people at a table or something but it feels like something more impactful to your life like more like you're seeing not literally beyond the, that moment does that make any sense um, well, can it be said maybe um, like um, life imitates art, art imitates life kind of moment, maybe? Kind of, yeah, maybe, depending on the life and the art, yeah. Well, I'll give you, um, I'll give you two examples. Last year, I did a nope. play called Sweat at the San Diego Repertory Theater. Right. Um, and I saw this one. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, and in it, I played the only... Um, brown person latin person in um in an entire cast of either black or white people mm -hmm. and this uh took place during the recession in a town that was hit very very hard factory workers and um and there and, and th this play was created based on interviews with people living in, 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 in a specific town, but also in towns like this and communities like this. Yep. And they often blamed um, Latin people for coming in and taking their you know, jobs. There were mm. strikes that were happening. And of course there were people crossing the picket line. And uh, for myself, it just so <clears throat> happened that I was the only I was the only <laughs> most I was the only non-union actor oh. in, in a full union cast mm. 
and at the core of the of the of the story was union versus non-union people and that was really tough for me it was just a little too meta sometimes and it was really difficult because you know some of the other up-and-coming actors there, there were actors who like had just sort of started their career Mm-hmm. recently and we're sort of edging a little bit ahead of me for whatever reason mm-hmm. you know I'm like I've been at this for about 14 15 years at my own pace <laughs> quality not not quantity and uh and just the, the you know these 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 noobs I don't mind calling <laughs> noobs with a z at the end oh my god N zero zero B Z news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> loved, loved talking about, loved talking shop, and loved talking about the union status. Oh. Um, and it it often felt like flaunting, and it mm. was happening. It was echoing in the script. Hmm. So perhaps it helped. Um, I I could have done without the um the notes of existential crisis in my own life. Um, but, uh, but it also, it also, helped. It, it resonated in a lot of the talkbacks mm. that we would do after shows and with um, students. Uh, so I, I mean, I took it, ran with it and we all acknowledged it and, you know, it was, um, it was what it was. Uh, hmm. <laughs> also, in my early twenties, I did a play with Ion Theater. Um, <laughs> is this like all unusable? Because <laughs> of dog. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> all right. Um, so, in my early twenties, I I did a play. Uh, where um, it was called um, Punks, and it was this mm. sort of like new take on um, Jean Genet's The Maids. Okay. Um, and Jean Genet, the playwright of The Maids, wrote this play uh, that was based on an actual crime where these two um, these two maids m- um, murdered their mistress. Yes. And were actually discovered, I think, by the cops, like bathing in her blood, or ah. like, bathing in her blood, and they were like, and and there were, and Jean Genet sort of kind of sexualized it a little bit, and so um, Ion Theater sort of did their own take on it. We were these uh, two Latin, you know, um, uh, street uh, hoodlums and prostitutes, and it was it was very edgy, very sexy. Okay. Okay, now that I've said that, I feel very vulnerable because what I'm about to say is that my personal life kind of echoed a lot of these. Um, <laughs> it was just, it was the relationship between the two men and I had a relationship of friendship at the time that the mm. lines were very blurred. Mm. And I was, I was experimenting at the time. I was, you know, drinking and, and, and doing experimental drugs. Um, and there were just, there were times when my life and then going into rehearsal was just like, there was no, there was no compartmentalizing. Uh, um, so I hope I'm, I'm speaking to the question that you had asked me yeah. about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I um, think so, kind of. Yeah, it's just that, yeah, sometimes, and that's like the universe, it's, it's cosmic, it finds you. Mm-hmm. And you're doing a project that you are ultimately kind of living out. Mm-hmm. And, the, the, you know, the challenge, the older I get, the, um, the, if that happens to me, if it finds me, the mm-hmm. challenge is to make it different so that I'm not actually just, ah. you know, I'm not just uh, transplanting data, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Not just so taking your actually, life in full blast, just like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because because my my most recent training is to use your imagination mm. and not not your not your actual real life, so that yeah. you can have uh, emotional health, right. you know, and have a well-rounded civilian life. But in the work, 
activate your your imagination that's what is important to me and that's what makes it a skill set um an actual trade a craft is that for me i am not a um uh uh, what's it called a not a struggling artist because that is what i um (laughs) um what is it called when you are um uh when you're suffering a suffering artist uh tortured artist tortured artist tortured (laughs) artist um that may happen from time to time for for whatever reasons but um i i've put in my time and i see that i see the difference now between being a tortured artist and sort of give feeding that yeah and activating your imagination and i think that that is more powerful if you work your imagination enough you can actually do absolutely anything and that's probably what makes me um a sociopath to some people <laughs> is that i can i can i can i can turn that switch oh, i just imagination. Have, what's that of imagination yeah i can, i guess i can i can activate it um and it is for me escapism even though i'm probably drawing on real shit sure 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 it's 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 where the authenticity comes in mhm that's where it yeah, and it's just that exists whether you want it to or not but um but i don't know maybe maybe it's a delusion of mine but my ex- my experience my perception is that i'm activating my my imagination cool well awesome marcus yeah. i feel like we've been doing this for like 2 hours <laughs> Just and about. Perhaps, perhaps now is the time to bring it to a close. Sure, we can also do pickup shots if uh, if you missed anything. <laughs> ah, sure. We could do the Burke cut of the uh, oh, of, God. the, of the intended <laughs> interview if uh, we didn't hit any spots. We can come do some pickup shots, and I'll 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 write it out. We'll we'll have to do three <laughs> right. different. By all means, um, you know that I love your written word. And going back to high school, you were the first, well, you and Jim Miller were the first to actually cast me in any notable (laughs) thing in my life. This wonderful um, sort of renaissance Uh, um, piece, uh, Darkness. Yes. Where I, I, I think that was the first villain I ever played. And... um, Hmm. Also got to do plenty of sword play. That that piece was uh, was was epic. That that was the two of us saying why why aren't you in any of these things? Marcus has to be in the show. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, it's definitely it was um it was a, a a like a super confidence booster in my life because you guys were absolute oh. gods to me. Not just in high school, continue to be. <laughs> Um, but uh, right back at you, sir. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I, uh, honestly, thank you for um, thank you for this this treat. And any thank any you. time you want to tackle any yeah. series of almost impossible scenarios and questions <laughs> to explore, yes. I am I am here for it. Excellent. Well, thank you. I will, right. I will let you know when this goes up, and I will, def- will definitely. Do I love it. you, brother. I love you, brother. Talk to you soon.